Is it like red? So I forgot that they was red. Yes. I'm so red. Yeah, I'm orange. I forgot my red. Is that the closest um, you could come to red? Today it was. Yes. 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 Oh my gosh. What are we doing? Girl Scout hand up? Oh yeah, yeah. Or is it this? I think it was three. I promise to do my best. We today is Reformation Sunday. Uh five hundred and four years ago. Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, and that really set off or sparked the whole Reformation in our faith and the way we worship and exactly, and, and made us relook at how, what we believe about who we are and who God is, and, um, and our own uh, faith and how we can celebrate it. In 1993, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America put out a statement, Why Lutherans Care for Creation. And in it, they say, Lutherans embrace the idea that the Reformation did not end in the 16th century and that it should be ongoing and continual. The church in each age is called to rise to the challenges posed by that era. In the 16th century, the chief issue that occupied Christians was the salvation of individuals. In our age, the most critical issue must surely be the fate of the earth, the challenge to protect and restore God's creation from the devastations caused by human activities. Addressing this challenge requires a new reformation in our time. For Christians, care of the earth is not an environmental cause. Rather, it is central to our holy calling to treasure the earth and to care for it as our common home fully integrating creation care into our love of God and neighbor. Earth care is not an add-on. It is not just for those who happen to be interested in it. It is a call for all Christians to participate in this great work of our time. To that end, this month, we've really been focusing on creation. Uh, who, what is creation? Who are we in the, and where do we fit in the, in the whole scheme of creation? Um, where is God in creation, and how do we relate to God and his creation? Um, and last week we had somebody um, come and speak to us about the advocacy, legal issues that are going on both locally and in Pennsylvania and a little bit at the federal level. And this week we are pleased to have Mary Margaret Monser, who is project manager of Growing Amber Greener. She's a master watershed steward. She served on the Amber Environmental Council, and she's an unflagging supporter of a greener, cleaner environment for everyone. And she, Madge, is going to be talking to us today on what we can do in our own homes and even here at our church and in our businesses. Um, simple, some are very simple steps, some are a little bit more complicated, but everybody can contribute to greener, cleaner water. Thank you. Thank you. How do you spell you. your last name? Monser, M-O-N-S-E-R. Thank you. And yes, I wholeheartedly agree that we all do have a responsibility. And, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, all along uh, the human species um, for a number of years, you know, worshiped the planet Earth and, and took care of it. When you think about the Native Americans who were here and, and how they tended the planet. And the human species, as we have evolved, we really are not doing our due diligence with being mindful of, of how we, we take care of our home, you know, our, our place that provides us with a, a life. And unless we make some pretty dramatic um, changes, um, 
it's frightening for me to think about the future for my children and my grandchildren. And I know that a lot of children or people not in my generation, our generation, the younger generations are really concerned about it. And that's weighing into their decisions about, you know, starting families and where are we gonna be and, you know, the anxieties that are arising. But, you know, I, a lot of us just put that out of our, our minds and, and I try to as well, because it does create anxiety in me. And I try to focus more on what I can do. What can I do in my own community? And I recognize that in, in our community, particularly Ambler Borough, which is a very urban, dense community, densely built out, stormwater is huge. And we also have a responsibility, a municipal responsibility to act on stormwater. With the changes in the climate and the rising temperatures, we're getting more dramatic weather patterns. When I first got started in better understanding what was going on, one of the very first conferences that I went to down in Philadelphia through uh, the Temple Sustainability Office, I heard back then, that was maybe seven years ago, that it's going to get hotter, more humid, and that we're going to have more dramatic storm events. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's going to be in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's happening right Changes now. Here. We're now getting... 100 year storms, you know, almost every year now. We've had two, one last year and one the year before with the hurricanes that have come through. And again, this year with the tornado that's come through, which is, you know, very unusual. So stormwater is huge. We are getting um, more intense storms with more water. And so what are we going to do about it? How many people here have issues on their property with stormwater, with water that just kind of sits or they get water in, in their properties on their, anybody? I know Elizabeth, <laughs> you've had some issues. You only have to take a look at her property to see how it's sloped and there's some apartments next to it and she's surrounded. In an area like Ambler, it, it's a big deal. So what can we do about it? Well, what is stormwater? Why should I care? What can I do about it? Wherever you live, you live in a watershed. Uh, who knows what watershed we're in right now? Wissahickon. Right. And Wissahickon uh, Trails, which used to be the Wissahickon uh, Watershed Association, Wissahickon Valley Watershed Association, has done a really nice job in promoting what they're doing for our our watershed and really putting it out there so people know what watershed they live in. But there's also sub watersheds, like every creek has its own little watershed, like the Rose Valley Creek and Tannery Run Creek and Prophecy Creek. Yeah, Prophecy Creek. Yeah, Prophecy Creek. Where is that? Bluebell. Yeah, and they've done a lot, a nice job with. Um, preserving land over there around Prophecy Creek and protecting that creek. So everything that happens in the land around a creek or around you has an impact on our local waterway. So preserving the land around Prophecy Creek has really helped to maintain the health of that creek. And so we each have a role that we can play in protecting water, which is one of the planet's most important resources. One good thing about the watershed areas is they have walkways so that people get to know it. Exactly. And, and I think that's really important. And that's a big reason why the Wissippin Valley Watershed Association changed its name and called themselves Watershed Trails. Mm -hmm. Because if you can bring people to the outdoors, if you can get them on trails, you can connect them to the environment. And if you can connect them to the environment and to our waterways, then you can grow environmental stewardship. We did three years ago uh, a holy hike at the Wissahickon. Uh, and it was multi-generational, it was beautiful. There were about 50 of us and I just so enjoyed working with the young folks who maintain that, that organization and, and that care, uh, just in, in working with them and setting things up. 
I learned so much. And I am a longtime resident of this part of the world mm -hmm. and yet was totally oblivious. You know, so anytime that we can physically be present, it's amazing how that can impact on the choices that you go to make afterwards. And your children. And for your children as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe taking a look here at the church, more of those type of activities to help engage the youth as they, you know, are growing um, can be really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're already starting now with um, looking at other avenues, like bringing myself in, bringing the person in last week, you know, to engage your community, because this is a great opportunity when you have a community that is connected already, how can we all work together, you know, to move forward in um, supporting environmental stewardship. And what you are doing, and I thank you, you're breaking mm -hmm. down the mentality, which is very strong. Mm -hmm. I can't do anything. Yeah, it does get discouraged. It, it does, it does. But there, yeah, like you said, simple things that you can do, just, you know, putting together a hike, um, showing people where trails are, getting people outdoors. I mean, your worship outside mm -hmm. is wonderful. I mean, with the trees and mm -hmm. just being outdoors mm -hmm. and listening mm -hmm. to the birds. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So here's, uh, the Ambler sub-watersheds, and this is just an example of how watersheds work. So you can see this pink here. This is Rose Valley Creek. Rose Valley Creek uh, runs right through Robbins Park. It starts oh, at Temple oh. Ambler. And that's, that's the creek that goes through Robbins Park, and then it goes through Ambler Borough and through Ambler Borough Park, and then eventually makes its way into the Wissahickon. So any of the water that flows, and this is, you know, the topography plays a large role in the waters that flow into a creek. So these are the three different creeks that run through Ambler. The green is Tannery Run. Most of Tannery Run is underground. And many of the tributaries in Philadelphia are underground because as a city grows, what they do is, you know, they just tunnel, you know, they, they just put in a big, huge tunnel, you know, a conduit for the water to flow through. And so most of Tannery Run goes underground. If you go to the Tannery Run Brewery in town, mm -hmm. they actually, down in their basement, there is a hole no way. <laughs> and you can look in really? and you can see the creek. Yeah. Tim mm -hmm. has taken me down there. We've wow. worked with them a little bit on, on a rain garden over at That's the Mennonite Church. Is it outside anywhere? I mean, yeah, is the, it is, is it the is creek open. outside? No, um, I just mean Tannery. Tannery creek. Run? Yes, yeah, it a, is outside in some parts. If you're familiar with the Ambler Rest Town, yeah. uh, right there on Bethlehem yeah. Park, across mm -hmm. from Fletcher Motors. Mm -hmm. It's open right there. Oh, really? oh. And it goes underneath Bethlehem Pike and oh. underneath that nursing home and then comes mm -hmm. out on the on the backside. And it's really beautiful back there. What we noticed is- in the backside. Um, so behind the nursing home? Back of that. Yeah, right behind the nursing home, there's like a little driveway because there's right on Butler Pike, there's a bunch of, um, uh, I don't want to really call them townhomes, but they're kind of like townhomes. They're old right. um, apartments, uh, brick, and... So it's behind their homes? Yes, like it's behind their drive. homes. There's a little driveway that you can get behind there. And when we were taking a look at the riparian buffer, which is the area alongside the creek that's really important to have shrubs and trees to help filter the water, but also to help with erosion. Yeah. We noted that the nursing home was pretty much mowing their grass right up to the edge of it. So we worked with them through this grant and we actually have done a number of tree plantings and shrub plantings over there, which will A, help support cleaner water, B, um, prevent erosion, and C, we took a look at including shrubs and trees that would attract wildlife and that also were pretty to look at so that when residents 
Oh. Or in their rooms, you know, they would have spring flowers to see or mid-season flowers. Or, so, you know, it's a win-win all the way around. And it also attracts more habitat, which is important for biodiversity. Um, and it might block litter from blowing into the stream too. Right, right. Because I see that a lot oh when my I walk goodness. in the trails, just the trash. Uh, it is so sad how much trash there is. Yes. It actually close here, close to where we're sitting. Yeah. Yeah. Rose, Rose Hill Cemetery. Right. Rose Valley Creek, Rose Hill Cemetery. You mean there's a creek up there? Yeah, the uh, right across the street here is where um part of the Rose Valley Creek comes in. Are you sure? Yeah, it goes from uh, Robbins Park. And you take a walk. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. yeah, when you, you walk, just don't see it when you're driving. There's a house that we looked at years yeah. ago on the corner, Patty Corner. Yeah. And they have a stream yeah. in their front yard. All right. We decided not to buy that house because of that stream. We were afraid of flooding. Uh, but it was a I sale I don't know, 18 years ago. That is yeah. absolutely wild. Mm -hmm. What you don't know. Two inches from your nose. <laughs> well, I, I didn't even know the names of these creeks when I started. <laughs> so, you know, it just, you know, you just, um, it just takes, you know, getting into it or somebody presenting it to you or, you know, having an interest. And I've always had an interest in the environment. And my children, as they got older, I mean, we spent a lot of time hiking, biking, visiting parks, creeks. Robbins Park was a mainstay for, for us when the kids were young. Um, but, but as they, they got older and I had more time, I didn't want to give up my interest in the environment and my desire to you know, continue to educate people so that we could continue to evolve environmental stewardship and take care of the land that, that we live on. Not just for me, but for our future generations. So the, those people in the corner where this creek goes through their property, do you sort of interact with them and make suggestions about their property ever and that kind of thing, sort of oh, personal one-to-one? -one? So in Ambler Borough, I have communicated with people yeah. um, about their properties that, that run along the creek. It's it, it can be very delicate because, yeah. you know, yeah. you don't want to point out that, hey, you shouldn't be mowing all the way up to yes, the edge. Yeah. You want to, yeah, yeah, you know, how can we support you? And a lot of times it's just education. People yeah. don't realize, they don't, they don't understand, you know, how important that is. Yeah. Um, you know, we get people who say, yes, you know, I want to do my part. But yeah, I'll plant a tree. I'll plant some shrubs here. And then a lot of those people have these beautiful lawns and they have lawn care people coming in and spreading all kinds of stuff. Like mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and, and that is a movement that is starting, naturalizing our properties and decreasing the amount of grass. And so... One of the things I can do, and one of the things you can do, is is be an example. And I've actually gotten rid of most of the grass on our property, and it's been a process over a couple of years and planting it up with natives. My husband's building a greenhouse right now, oh, cool. so it's almost done. But it's a pretty significant. So you live in Amherstburg. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it, it's. It's being the example. Does anybody know that strip of land, um, strip of grass in between your sidewalk and the street? Mm -hmm. Some people call it the hell strip. And some people say it's there so that dogs have a place to do their business. Uh, True. Like in, in the Midwest, they call it a tree line. It can be a tree line if it's wide enough. Like over in the Haywood Park section of Ambler, it's four feet wide. In front of my yeah. property, it's you know maybe 12 inches, yeah. but it was just grass. It was a pain to mow. So yeah. I have now completely planted it. And now I've changed some of the plantings as my knowledge base has increased to include milkweed all along oh, there, recognizing yeah. how important it is 
um, to promote and provide um, native plants so that we can maintain our biodiversity. We are losing so many insects and butterflies because our largest crop in the United States is grass. It is the largest crop and monarchs don't lay eggs on grass. They lay it on, on milkweed and as the milkweed has diminished, they, so has their population. So just planting milkweed in that health strip has brought monarchs to my property, which is so much fun to watch. You know, last year when I had a little bit more time, my daughter and I uh, collected the butterflies and put them in, you know, a screened um, tent-like uh, thing with fresh milkweed every day. We watched them munch, 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 <laughs> then make their chrysalis, oh, which cool. is the most amazing jade green Ooh. with these little five dots. gold yeah. dots. And then, you know, then we watched them as they came out of their chrysalis oh, and, and let them go. And it was oh. just so cool, you know, to, <laughs> to experience that with my 19 that's I, I have to share that with the men in my family. They obsess you, on grass. How do your neighbors feel about this milkweed growing in the front of yeah. your yard? Well, you know, do you have your neighbors on your side too? This is like this is what I get from all the people who go down my street. I live on Forest Avenue. They're going to St. Anthony's. I've had people stop and say, "Thank you so much. Oh. I really appreciate oh, driving past your house. It makes me smile." I've had people, I had a woman once who stopped and cut my, my son's flowers. So I was a little annoyed by that. <laughs> it's like, okay, wow. I really need them, but you know, I leave, I, I want them here too, you know, because it does, it makes other people happy. Mm -hmm. My neighbor on, I only have one neighbor on one side because I live right on the corner. Um, Janet was a gardener too. She was fine with it. When Janet moved, now I have Mary Spross. Mary is an environmentalist oh, like yeah. myself. Oh. Couldn't have been a more perfect new neighbor to have. Mm -hmm. We're about the same age. And now she has a rain garden on her front property. And yeah, um, I think the only time I've gotten any um, negative negativity is there's one planning commission member who would walk down our street to walk his dog and he would complain to our zoning code guy that, and, and I say, you know, it's a sensory experience. You want the plants to brush up against you. And who taught me that was, I think, what is her name again? Is it Mary Carey? Um, she's a gardener. She's a pretty big gardener who uh, was in charge of Temple's Arboretum for quite some time, and then went on to manage PHS's Meadowbrook Gardens. And she lives right at the corner of Norristown Road and, and Butler Pike here. And I went to her garden. I, I actually ran into her because I was building a rain garden. And the guy who was next door came out, well, what are you doing? And I started to tell him, I was like, okay, I'll take a rain garden. It was like the easiest rain oh, garden yeah. cell I ever had. Mm -hmm. It turns out that he's the gardener, Jenny. Jenny Rose Carey is her name mm -hmm. for Jenny. And so he invited me to go and take a look at her gardens, which are just expansive mm -hmm. and absolutely beautiful. Which she's, corner? Norristown? Butler, yeah, it's Norristown Road. It's, mm -hmm. it's where Twin Spring Farms yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Her property is right back in there. Oh, okay. And it's hidden oh, from the road. But oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know what you mean when you say a rain garden. Well, let me let me get to that. No, <laughs> she didn't mean to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what let's go back to what stormwater is. It's simply too much water not absorbed or filtered in the ground. It picks up pollutants and sediments from hard surfaces before entering storm drains that flow into our waterways. And if you can see this picture right here. This is where there was some construction happening up here. And this is a silt sock. And the silt sock is supposed to wrap around here and it's supposed to keep the sediment from washing into, you can see this storm drain right down here. Mm -hmm. 
Now look at this brown water here. This is all the sediment that is washed off this construction area and is now going into the storm drain. If you look over here, the water is much clearer. Um, it still has pollutants in it that it's picking up from the roadway, but it's not nearly as bad as all this sediment. Sediment is the number one pollutant in our waterways. And that's why it's important to control for sediment. And it, when I saw this, this is a picture I took, I was just horrified. I notified our code enforcement officer who went out and talked to the homeowner and you know had him seed that area so that it wouldn't wash off so dramatically. Because um, it was pretty dramatic. And like I said, a lot of times homeowners just don't know. Let's see if we can get this to work. Are the reports that we get about our water true? Oh, what do you mean by that? You mean the quality of it, like from the water company? Yeah. Uh, like the testing, like of, of what's in it. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're true. I mean, they have to they have to do testing that pretty regularly. And, or once a year, I think they have to send it out to residents about what what the different levels are. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is understanding it. You yeah. know what it means. <laughs> yeah. We live in horseshoes. I think you do too. Yes, that's a big concern. Right with the PFAS and the PFAS. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. there's a lot going on with that right now. Yes, there is. And I think the EPA is coming down with. Um, uh, more stringent regulations for that. And I think they're going to start to identify waterways where it is an issue. So there, there is a lot that's being done. And I think that what happened in Horsham really has highlighted it. Oh, you know, yeah. it's I'll tell you, country. it scared me to no end. Oh, it, yeah. It made me think I was back in Silkwood. Remember that movie? Mm -hmm. You know, just, oof. Yeah, I mean, it's like, the damage was done already. Yes, yeah. yeah. it's all, it's so already it had been done. denied for yeah. years, though. Yeah, yeah, it had been covered up for years. Right. So th this is a nice little <coughs> video that can speak to you about storm water. We open the faucet, and it's always there, clean, safe, and abundant. Water, the essence of life. <gasps> We eat it every day, but we often forget that safe drinking water starts way before it gets to our tap. <gasps> Before the pipes that lead to our home, even before the complicated process of treatment and disinfection that makes raw water drinkable, it starts here at the source. In Pennsylvania, our source water can be from surface water, like our rivers, lakes, and streams, or groundwater, the aquifers that lie beneath the earth. Public water suppliers tap into these sources to provide us with our drinking water. No matter where our water comes from, it's affected by what happens on the land around it. As we develop the landscape, we create more impervious surfaces and change the natural water cycle. When it rains, water can no longer seep into the ground. Instead, it travels as runoff, picking up pollutants on its way to rivers and streams. We all contribute to the contamination of our water. Contamination of our source water supplies can cause disease and become very costly to clean. And sometimes that contaminated water might be impossible to clean and the source must be abandoned. Fortunately, it doesn't have to be this way. We can prevent contamination from happening. We can use best management practices on farms and industrial sites. We can manage runoff from roofs and driveways by naturalizing our yards. We can protect green space and create buffer zones along rivers and streams. We can put zoning controls and stormwater regulations in place. Protecting water resources sustains local wildlife, attracts businesses, promotes tourism, and assures a more affordable quality of life for our families and future generations. Clean water benefits all of us. Click here to get started. And that, that's a really good resource, the Stormwater PA. I have a question. Oh, sure. Um, 
as a child, we'd go into Philadelphia to visit our grandparents, and we when we drank the water from their spigot, it tasted so differently from the water that we had out here in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Is that still going on in the city? That, that whatever caused that taste in my mouth, that metallic? Yeah. Well, I think water tastes different mm -hmm. from different locations because, yeah. you know, so like it's not we, something we, you're putting in then. We get well okay. water here, right? Which is is the water that that we use, and and yeah, they do put stuff in in there. I don't know what it is, um, but. It does taste different from area to area. And uh, here in Ambler, I know that the Ambler uh, Wastewater Treatment Authority, who manages all of our, our clean water as well, that uh, has very hard water. So we have a lot of issues with, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think hard water is very prevalent in this part of the world. Yeah, it really mm -hmm. is. And uh, I know a lot of people here don't like the taste of ambler water. I don't know. I've been drinking it my whole life. And maybe that's because that's all I know. I, I think you noticed, and I grew up in Philly and then here in Ambler, it has a lot of um, chlorine paste or whatever. Yes. It's whatever they put into purifying it before it yeah. gets to your home. Mm -hmm. And so, and especially after a rain or anything like that, sometimes you'll notice the taste more. But I think it's that combination of basically the base taste of the water and then anything they add to the sure, right. sure. Yeah, which is uh, chlorine a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. But those like Brita filters really do oh, a terrific yes. job. I mean, yeah. I have had one for years that I keep right near my counter and every time I, I do yeah, use well. some and I, rather, I mean, I'm just so averse to buying bottled water. I yeah. just Thank you. Try. Thank you for being adverse oh. to buying bottled <laughs> water. <laughs> Right. You know, there was a time when bottled water did not exist. Who remembers that? Probably oh, all yeah. of us here in the room. Yes. And then, you know, that it was marketed to everybody. And now it's a huge industry. Mm -hmm. and, and what's happening is that these giants, giant corporations are paying like, you know, small amounts of money. $250 for the rights to this stream. Mm -hmm. And they're draining all the water from that stream. And so that leaves all the farmers down downstream without, without the amount of water that they need mm -hmm. for their production of uh, crops. And so it really is, um, people are starting to take note and take a look at that a little bit more carefully and put in place you know, start to um, try to work with these larger corporations. But you know how they have, you know, very deep pockets. Yes. And it can be a challenge. It is heartening when I go to my grandkids' sporting events and soccer games and stuff, how many of the kids do have water bottles. <laughs> their own. Reusable water right. bottles yeah. rather than yes, the bottle of water. Yeah, and I and I think people are are starting to move towards that, um, which is really helpful. Tell me if I'm doing it wrong. I have been pushing hard, and pretty close to success of us getting the big, yes, water containers. Am mm -hmm. I creating that's a problem? That's bottle of water, though, isn't it? What's that? You mean the big jugs, like? Yeah, so that we can yeah, but that's these. better than getting, I mean, individual, than having the individual, individual bottles that just used to drive me nuts. Right. And, and then, then yeah, I, mean, I, I just have to have this. Or another, another thing, they mm -hmm. have, they have, mm -hmm. you can actually get a state, I mean, if the issue is nobody likes the water, then that would be better than individual water bottles. But if the issue is you don't have the capacity for somebody to refill a water bottle, um, they also now have these stations where, just like there used to be water fountains, only it's a, it's mm -hmm. a station it's that you can use to refill. You'll see them a lot at like universities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Okay, there you go. Yeah. Ambler Y, so places like that. And you know, I thought it was maybe a little step forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's a step forward. I don't know. 
drop. I haven't had anything from these fountains for years, but I remember they had a very copper, oh, copper taste. It was it. awful. It tasted like yeah, copper. It used to be no, I don't. I, I think they're all shut off. They may okay. be. Yeah. Yeah. As far and, as I and two, you can put in a filter. There's the capacity. So you know, it might be looking at a grant or something to. You know, take that's a project, it sounds like, for a little task force. <laughs> well, I'm just sitting there thinking, oh dear God, I'm doing something wrong. I would push it so hard for I it. think, like Elizabeth said, that's a step in the right direction. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. one step forward. Well, there are filters for your spit. Spigots. We yeah, have one. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm not that bad. We do have. Filters. You're not bad at all, Claire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a judgment of your. No, no, I know. I'm just, I'm just kidding. kidding. That's like something that, as we go forward, I know we're doing like a whole UPLC that has a whole vision that they're kind of looking at things again. That might be something to bring up to council. That okay, people, you know, what can we do to help decrease our plastic use and improve our water? By a bunch of yeah, it's the, the example by mm -hmm. um, switching from using um, individual water bottles to you know a larger filling station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so there's yeah, that we can do, and I think people, you know, as long as people understand what you're doing, they oh yeah, that makes sense. So here, uh, this is just an example of what happens in our streams during a rain event. So the, the dotted line represents how Mother Nature intended for a storm event to happen with the stream. So here it is running normally. Then we get a storm event. There's a rise in the waterways and then a slow decline as the water comes back to its baseline. And you'll also note that the water levels are higher before and after. What's happened in our creeks with all the development, instead of the water infiltrating in place, it's now washing off. So you have this dramatic rise in the waterways, in the creeks, and that causes a lot of erosion. And then there's a dramatic decline and so our waterways now, because they're not getting, after the storm has passed, traditionally out, you know, before we urbanize the area, the water would infiltrate into the ground and then slowly it would recharge our, our creeks. That's not happening anymore. So you'll note that um, in between storms, our creeks actually don't have as much water in them as they used to have. And so that impacts habitat because the water is washing away during those dramatic storm events and you don't have the um, the underground uh, percolation. Perc percolation, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking of the flooding too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, flooding is a huge issue. Um, and it's a huge issue in Ambler that you know, the borough doesn't really have an answer for, but there's been, there's several areas that flood pretty consistently and homeowners have done everything that they can do um, to minimize the amount of water that gets in their basements. And wow. we still get water in their basements, but they're trying to minimize it because we're getting such huge storms. Yes, it is a little bit hilly. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful I live uphill. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> it wasn't planned, it just happened. So there's many threats to our creeks, inconsistent water flow, erosion, flash flooding, and polluted runoff. And you can see these are some pictures during storm events, how eroded this is right here. This is actually um, just upstream from this is an outflow for a stormwater system. And Ambler Borough is actually putting in some new stormwater inlets, which are going to, you know, it just, it boggles my mind that we are not looking at putting in place green stormwater infrastructure that, you know, the first thing that we go to is an inlet to allow the water to go through the storm system and end up in our creeks, because it's just going to exacerbate our issues with sedimentation and with pollutants and nutrients. Nutrients is the second largest um, pollutant in our waterways. And this is just a picture down here during a flooding event. 
the creek is all the way over here and this is just all the water that is a lot of sheet flow and then this is what a creek looks like you can't see that picture very well um, I think uh, with the lighting there but there's a lot of erosion right around here um, lower the lights I think I I think we're okay. okay. Yeah. Um, these are these are many of the stormwater issues in Ambler. This intense flooding. Um, see how high this is this is risen in the Rose Valley Creek. Um, another big thing is trash day is on uh, Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? Wednesday. Wednesday. We put out our trash Tuesday evenings for Wednesday pickup. Well, if there's a storm on Tuesday and it's there's a lot of wind and you haven't secured the lid or you have trash that's just kind of sitting there, mm -hmm. that trash gets blown all over the place. And then the storm picks up that trash and this is where it ends up. This is just the trash that didn't end up was too big to go down the um, storm drain. But further down the street, there's a great big opening and there's water bottles that go through there. Oh, so when we wonder how how do, do pollutants and plastics end up in the ocean from you know our community? Well, that's how, and we're contributing to it because we have so much litter, cigarette butts. Those yeah. very readily go. I I had somebody last week who stopped in front of my house. Um, who was chatting with somebody else who had stopped in front of my house and she took her cigarette butt and flicked it out the oh. window. And I, I, waited a little, I waited a little bit because I'm wondering what is going on. And, uh, and then I went out there after a little bit. I'm like, oh, are you guys okay? Do you need anything? Oh, no, we're just exchanging groceries. I, and then I went and I picked up her cigarette butt and I said, do you need an ashtray for this? Yeah. 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 She's like, oh, I'm really sorry. And, and she had like an empty cup that she put it in. But it was like, you know, finding an avenue to nicely, <laughs> nicely make the point of, you know, these cigarette butts are pollutants, yeah, yeah, is, you know, that end up in our waterways. And, and that's what I let her know. I said, you know, we really work hard in our community. We have cigarette cleanup days um, because these cigarette, cigarette butts. Cleanup. Yeah, cigarette yeah. butt cleanup. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm great to pick up all the cigarette butts on 73. You know, oh, you know where oh, the smokers are oh. because they flick. There's oh. like in our community okay. because they'll flick their butts. They'll yep. sit on their porches and smoke. Yeah, oh. I thought it was their butts out smoking into the street. Climbing. That was fun so too. Well, it is. It is declining, it is, but there are funny. people. Climbing. So people, there's no ashtrays in cars anymore oh. for people who oh. smoke. Oh, they, they'll smoke in their yeah, car yeah, and they'll yeah. flick it out a window. Mm -hmm. And so you can find cigarette butts all along mm -hmm. the street. I've decided that it's pitiful. It, it is pitiful. Um, you know, so we, we try to clean them up and it's a way to also um, promote to people that cigarette butts are litter. And, and they don't go away. Those filters last for They but, do. Yeah, they do. Not yeah. like they buy a degree. No, no, they don't. You're so gracious. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, not, every, not everybody can come across that way. Yeah, yeah. stop dropping your true. cigarette bottle. Yeah. 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 I, I, I well, you know, I, I, I've learned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't always this way, but I figured it out that you know, for the most part, you have to kind of, you have to find that yeah. avenue of. Yeah. You don't want to anger people or make them yeah, defensive. Yeah. Emily, you were going to say? I was going to say on, on up UDLC cleanup day, Bruce used to go around and pick up all the butts on our property. You know, on our church property? Yes. We're, we're smoking. Absolutely. Well, we have a lot of visitors that come by and flick their cigarettes from their cars. Oh, I see what you're saying. I thought you meant yeah. we had smoking spots. No, 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 no. Okay. No, but yeah. he would especially along the yeah. street. Yeah, the street. Right. Because yeah. cars are sitting there. Yeah. And she, I've never cigarettes. thought about how people flick out the Oh, oh yes. Yeah. I never really, I didn't think about the fact that there are no longer ashtrays in cars. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. it used to be when we were yeah. 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 
Yes. Yeah, I, can, I can remember when with ashtrays in cars, people would be in a parking lot or something. Yeah. Yes. 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 I, I think that. personally, and I, uh, maybe I see things differently, I feel there are less cigarette butts around. Than they're right. used to it. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there's less. But there are still, there's still are. There's still, yeah. people are still smoking, so there's going to be butt. I didn't realize how dangerous the butt was until you were saying it, oh, yeah. it's not yeah. degraded, yeah. but it doesn't oh, violate. Right. So, one, one place we've noted in our community is near the septic station. Oh, oh it's huge. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. So, here, here's another picture here of. If you can, this is the sidewalk right yeah. over here. This is during a storm event, and this is all the water running off. Yeah. Wow. And mm -hmm. Rose Valley Creek is right down here. And if we could just, you know, put in put a uh, a bump out in there that has um, plantings in it. So a bump out is like. Uh, it comes out from the curb, it kind of extends the curb, mm -hmm. and it has plantings in it, and it has curb cuts to allow the water to come into there, so it has a place to infiltrate, mm -hmm. and capturing some of the water, so not as much runs mm -hmm. into our creeks. So non-point source water pollution oh, is... Geez is a big deal and i i took this picture this ended up just being some discolored iron um that people weren't as concerned about um, but what it says is whenever you see something that doesn't make sense to you or that looks odd like this discolored water call wissahickon trails or call, I trust Pacific Trails more than I trust my municipality. <laughs> no, that's just me. Yeah, or you can also call the Montgomery County Conservation District and, and report it. Take a picture of it, um, the date, the time, and where it is, and report it to them because they want to know. They want to go out, they want to look at it, and make sure that it isn't something that is polluting mm -hmm. our waters. And one again, Montgomery County, what? Conservation District. Right. But your first choice was Wissahickon Trails. In this area, yes, I would call Wissahickon Trails. And I would also call my municipality. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, and I don't know Upper Dublin as well as I know Ambler. I know how overwhelmed they are. And I know it would probably depend on the situation. Uh, here's a, another example. I was driving home from work, uh, just crossed over the railroad tracks on Mount Pleasant. I noted that there was a stream of black water that was being pumped from somewhere and it was going along the curb and then flowing down uh, Mount Pleasant. I immediately pulled over and I called the code enforcement officer and let him know because then I noted that there was a truck and it looked like they were cleaning off a rooftop. Oh, God. And he immediately came out and had them stop doing what they were doing. Because you can't for you. You can't you can't discharge dirty water right out into the street like that. That water was headed straight for Wissahickon Creek. And that's just gonna pollute the creek anything like that. Uh, here's another example. Walking down the street one day, there was um, some cement workers who were completing a job. And they were um, disposing of their, their water that was left over. They kind of let the sediment settle out and then they were just letting it, you know, pouring it down the curb. They can't do that. I, in this instance, I just kind of no, oh, are you sure that's legal to be able to discharge that there? You know, I kind of played dumb and I'm like, you know, I've heard that that has to go to special, uh, you know, storm drains and, and which is true. Well, it was very nice having you <laughs> Thank here. Thank you so Thank much. You. I'm sorry. I can take well. so. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, in, in uh, it's illegal to uh, you know, the up on top of the ground pools yeah. to let the water 
come out. It is. It is. And, and one of my neighbors was doing that, so I played your role. Yeah. And I said, "Oh, geez," I said, "I don't want you to get in trouble, but right. you know, so and so." And I, I think someone else saw it, and so she stopped right away. I, I don't know. And what, what about? I guess wow. I do something bad that I shouldn't do. I wash my car. Oh, I was just doing the same thing. thing. I what's the, my what's the alternative? Too. I guess going well, to professional car wash. Yeah. yeah, yeah, professional. And yeah. and we used to wash our cars in our driveway as it's well. So Mm -hmm. And and we've stopped that practice. You know, once I realized, okay, all these soaps that mm -hmm. I'm using are, you, you know, know going <laughs> off in. and so, so easy to just squirt down your car in the driveway. Yeah, okay. and and so my husband got yeah. like a he 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 was an Uber, uh, Uber driver or whatever Lyft driver for a little while. He really likes to keep his car clean, mm -hmm. so he got like a monthly thing to get his car clean. So now we just go to the car wash periodically. Here's another non-point source um, pollution is salt. Oh, oh yes. my gosh. And that is oh, way too much salt. salt. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see that, you know, yeah. ice isn't even a really big factor on this day. Mm -hmm. And um, this was just put there preventatively in case there was ice. I think mm -hmm. that many people have gotten much better about salt use. Um, a lot because mostly because they're worried about their pet's feet mm -hmm. but also all that salt ends up in our waterways every uh during the winter season we monitor the chloride levels mm -hmm. in the rose valley creek and it went from a baseline last year of 33 parts per million up to um the high was over 400 parts per million oh, so it really does end up in our waterway. So we're not saying don't use salt, use it judiciously and use it when you need to. The best thing you can do is as soon as it's snowing or done snowing, go out, clean off your sidewalks, let the sun do its job and melting anything residual. And then if there, it ices up, judiciously put some salt on it you can sweep up the salt afterwards does the chloride not the sodium that's the problem the chloride tends to be the bigger issue um do you guys work with the environmental science classes at upper Dublin high school at all or the Michigan high school environmental science oh uh, we we've partnered with them uh in just chatting with them about stuff in the past is it Lisa Fantini? Yeah, I think. Chris Smith. Yeah, when they were um, when they were they're working on the project over at Robbins Park to rebuild Robbins Park. Mm -hmm. So I know. Because um, I would think you know, students might enjoy doing some of the water testing. It you know it is a great the yeah it is it's a really water. simple. Um, uh, let's see, they call it community science. It's a simple community science project. Mm -hmm. that it's a great do. idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can, I can um, give you that link uh, to the program that you can okay. put on the, yeah, yeah. 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 So Isaac Walton. Walt, Walt. So I, I think our time is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. So let's come back again. <laughs> Oh, I would love to come back again. This has been so informative. So you can at least answer it. Don't yeah. put run down the way. There we go. So here, here's important. some things you can oh, do. Oh, look at that lovely rain barrel. You can put in place rain barrels, rain gardens, downspout planter boxes. You can convert your property to pervious pavers. You can protect riparian buffers. And you can plant trees. Is that your property there with those beautiful? Uh, no, that actually is the Denzines property. They live down on Edgewood. Um, we've gone out and we've done stormwater assessments or master watershed stewards. I'm a master watershed steward. As Elizabeth said, that's a program that's run by the county through Penn State Extension. They offer a class every spring. It's uh, I think it's 15 weeks long. You meet once a week for three hours and you learn all the basics about um, watersheds and how important our watersheds are, our trees, invasive plants, um, macro invertebrates. It was the most exciting class I ever took. When I took it a few years ago before COVID, we went on a field trip every week to a different place where we were introduced to a project that was going on, like how to increase the fish habitat over here. And then we heard from the 
fish and wildlife. Uh, What's the name of the course again? It's a Master Watershed Stewards. And it's offered by Penn State Extension. Okay, yeah, send me that in. And so as Master Watershed Stewards, um, some of us have started to go out and we'll do stormwater assessments for residents to, you know, help them look at, you know, where they can make differences. Oh, kind. Oh, kind. Yeah, it, it's really helpful. Like this resident, for instance, right here, uh, here they have some issues with their stormwater. It's running off close to their house in their backyard. It was an opportunity for permeable pavers. And rain barrels are a great avenue. Rain barrels hold 50 gallons of water. You can repurpose that water. Mm -hmm. It's important to empty them between storms. Otherwise, they're pretty ineffective. Mm -hmm. um, but I know if you get water from Ambler, our rates are going to be going up in uh, the next couple of years pretty significantly. And so having water that you can use to water your outdoor plants can help to uh, keep your costs a little bit lower. And you can connect rain barrels together um, so that you can conserve more water. We had a program, this is us working with Upper Dublin students mm -hmm. as part of their senior project. They um, built five rain barrels and we put them in our business district to support plant Ambler who used to bring in jugs of water oh, oh. to water their plants. And so now we've tried to strategically put rain barrels in place so that they have access to water instead of carrying all these jugs. And they've been um, very so appreciative. Clever. Wow. Where are rain barrels available? Uh, I have rain barrels available. If you would like a rain barrel, you can contact me. Oh, let me just write down. You keep going. And okay. I'll, I'll... Um, so we're going to make this available online. I can put it on our website. Oh, okay. yeah. So, yeah. so yes. through our grant, we Thank still you. have a number of rain barrels available. And at this point in our grant process, if somebody wants a rain barrel, I'm happy to provide one. Go to our adult. Oh, oh. We, we have green. Uh, av we have a link to um, growing a greener banana. Somebody said, should I? Yeah, they can, not, yeah, not they, they can, they can go through that or, yeah, they can contact me directly. Okay. Um, it, it has a diverter. A diverter is necessary um, to get the water. And we sell the diverters. We just ordered a whole bunch of them so that when somebody gets a rain barrel, they can, because the diverter wasn't a part of the grant they can um, already have a diverter to go home with and it would just charge the cost, which is $25, rather than have Amazon come out to the community 250 times <laughs> for each individual person. Uh, and we also help, uh, we'll also come out and install the rain barrel once you have a stand for it. And oh, that's sweet. The, yeah, it wow. only takes a minute to install it and it's, it also provides an opportunity to go over with the resident again, you know, some of the tips about rain barrels and how to use it. And it requires a hole saw. Not everybody has a hole saw. And so, it, you know, like I said, it, it's, it's like a big bit like this okay. so that you can um, you drill a hole downspout. into the downspout. Oh, oh, that's the word. I couldn't figure out what that word was. And Ooh. rather than the, these type of barrels, um, if you see the diverter, rather than having to cut off your downspout, uh, it just connects to the downspout. So when the barrel fills up, the overflow goes through the downspout and back, back that way. And you'll, in some of our big storms that we get, you know, those flashy storms, that barrel fills up in five minutes. And Seriously. Wow. Seriously, it is full. Oh, wow. And then the rest of the water goes through the downspout. Jeez. We have two water barrels, and as long as we have 0.4 to 0.5 inches of rain, it's full. Oh, wow. And so then the you rest said 0.4. Point. Point. Point 0.4 or point. so, that, like That's around a half an inch. We got an inch of rain all last night. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, was So that's a, there's another yeah. program, the Coco Rajas program, that allows residents to participate in measuring rain. Oh, 
I'll have to come back and do. Yeah, yeah. we're sending the link. And yeah, yeah. come back. And and it's it's <laughs> a great simple community science system. program. And um, so I know right in Ambler where I am, we got 0.52 inches of rain. But I know like over here in Fort Washington, they got like 0.27. So it's it's really fascinating to see how different it is from area to area. Yeah, the tornado was the same way. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that, that hailstorm. Oh, oh, God. God. oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> so this is a downspout planter box. Um, it's probably the least efficient of the tools, yeah. but it, it says, hey, I'm doing my part. And it allows for the water that comes off of your rooftop to be filtered. So there's a lot of sediment from your roof, actually. Um, and so it, it collects that and keeps it out of the waterways. So they're kind of, they're a decorative planter box oh, that yeah. is fabricated. Like we, we get the base and then we fabricate the inside and create all the plumbing, so to speak. And, and then we go out and we install them and plant them. This one, this is right after this one was planted. So the plants are, you know, not, Fully grown, yeah. They're newbies. Yeah, they're newbies. This was a really challenging one to do because I had this brick walkway and I had to take it across the brick walkway and then I had to take it down and then turn it into a rain garden mm -hmm. and I had to put it all underground. So that one took me a little bit. It was a little wow. tricky, but it How worked out really it well. It, uh, what do you mean? How do you keep it from draining? So that the water doesn't accumulate. Well, that's a good. So what happens is this has a false bottom. So it's much like a rain barrel. Right. And if, when it fills up, okay. the overflow goes through here, any, any overflow. And then you see this little green hose mm -hmm. in the back here. Mm -hmm. So that's connected to the back. And then that provides, it's, it's just a slow drip, drip, drip. So after the storm has passed, the water that's collected in the bottom will slowly drip out. And so then the hose goes off to another area where it can just slow release of the water. Hmm. And then we come to rain gardens. Rain gardens are a, a fabulous tool that provide infiltration, habitat, um, our program provided a $1,300 subsidy to residents. And these are just a couple pictures here. This is how a rain garden works. So when it rains, the rain goes down the downspout. We collect the rain and it will either flow across like a bioswale with stones, or you can actually put in some PVC piping underground because you want to carry that water away from your house. You don't want it to be right up uh, against your house because then you'll end up with water in your basement. And it, it goes out to essentially a flower bed that is between six and 12 inches deep. And it has a berm on one side so that it can hold the water. It flows in and it's planted with native plants. Um, we, we purposely put in native plants. They have a long root structure. That long root structure helps to loosen the soil. It also attracts native um, bees, butterflies, and insects. So it's going to support biodiversity. Um, and then the water is collected in there during a storm event. And within 48 hours, all of the water is infiltrated. If it doesn't infiltrate within 48 hours, then we have to go back and do remediation. Um, and we had one rain garden that was like that, um, that we had to go back and actually put in a seepage pit because the, the soil was just so, it's such intense clay. Um, and then there's, there's an overflow. So then when we get really large storms uh, that can't hold all the water, it has an avenue to overflow, which is usually leads towards the street or the sidewalk or away from the house. 
or onto the grass, depends on where, where the rain garden is. Um, Elizabeth just had a rain garden built and hers is very large because she has, she has a downslope, the way the topography of her land is downslope. And there's also a steep hill on the other side that contributes. So she gets a lot of water. Can you see? Sure? Yeah, do come picture. It's hard to get the perspective, but maybe we can come to your house for a field trip. Oh, oh yes, it is. I think <laughs> cool. yes. this one is pretty large because we get so much off of the How new is uh, that? last week. <laughs> it collected a lot of water and within 24 36 hours it left and now it's full again <laughs> that's great but we've it, had it, a lot it of water this it did its job, job. Yeah. It's right so right. it used to just go zooming right out into it was like the river river about going yeah. into the yeah. and right right yeah. in front of her rain garden in the street is a, an inlet a stormwater inlet um, so we really want to prevent as much, keep as much water as we can where it falls and allow it to infiltrate the place. So Rick made that initial so rain nice. garden, wow. and then he has the overflow going into like a smaller area um, before any of it would trickle out into the street. So we're capturing a lot more water there. And there's many benefits to rain gardens. It slows down stormwater runoff, filters pollutants, prevents runoff from polluting our local rivers and streams. They increase property values and provide an attractive landscape feature. It also creates habitat that attracts birds and butterflies. And there's a rain garden that we put in for that homeowner. Here's another one. This was shortly after it was put in. This year, this one, this was its first year. They look so different, um, you know, as they mature. The, the final thing you can do is a permeable conversion. So if you have a patio that's cement, we would much rather residents put in a permeable or porous pavement um, because that just helps uh, keep that water in place. Mm -hmm. And it really is all about environmental stewardship. We can be the difference through responsible use and protection of the natural environment by employing conservation and sustainable practices. And, and that's really what we're trying to do is engage residents in understanding what stormwater is, why you should care, what you can do about it. And through that, we hope to grow environmental stewardship. Thank you. I just wish the whole congregation. Well, yeah, I'm sitting here once. Once I'm allowed to get the men's lunch group up again, we have people come in and speak. Yeah, perfect. You're just top yes. of the list. Oh, I would love to come yes. in and speak again. Well, yeah, they, they need that uh, spring house rest uh, the tavern for lunch. There's about maybe 2025. Mm -hmm. so yeah, there's I, another audience, is what I'm, I'm and thinking. And there's, there's a lot more things that I can go over. Uh, the Coco Rajas 